Hello and welcome to our second instalment of Brew with Billy, where we talk about all things mental health over a nice cup of tea with some very special guests. And today we are joined by Dr. Duncan Gillard, who is a fellow educational psychologist. Um, he's got his brew ready, perfect. Um, he, he's also co-author of um, ACT for Dummies, which is Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Um, and he's also the creative director of Connect PSHE, which is a PSHE programme based all around wellbeing. So welcome, Duncan. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, so just to introduce a bit about Brew with Believe, the reason that we came up with this concept really was because I feel like there's a bit of a conflict at the minute where people really have a thirst for understanding more about mental health and really um, want to know how to support children. But at the same time, people are really overwhelmed, really busy and a bit webinared out. Um, so that's the purpose really behind today of having just a nice informal chat about mental health where hopefully people can get lots of information, practical advice, um, and also hear a bit more about Connect because I think it could be a really useful um, programme for lots of schools and it already is a really useful programme for lots of schools. But um, let's, let's begin with um, the question that we always ask to start us off, which is what sparked off your passion for mental health? <clears throat> oh, I think I'd probably track it back to my teenage years, really. I didn't have, as I look back, the easiest teenage years. They were, as they are, I think, for so many teenagers, actually kind of confusing times. And yeah, hard to find a sense of purpose and direction, I think. And I'm really couple, two or three years of just feeling a, a little bit of a lack of both of those things. Like, what am I doing and what's this about, you know? And so, and also a sense of struggling to articulate my internal world. Like I, I remember that very viscerally when I look back to my teens. Uh, it's just hard to put your thoughts because they're whirling around at such pace. Well, they certainly felt like they were for me anyway. And, and your feelings into, into words. And, and, and in, in many ways, that's a kind of more micro way of talking about sort of figuring out what, you, what you're about and articulating who you are and who you want to be in the world. That's a, that's a real struggle for me in my teens, actually. And... Um, School experience was good socially, but educationally, I really lacked a sense of purpose and, and well, meaning and connection to the purpose of school life. Like I didn't particularly engage well at kind of, you know, formal mandatory school level with the school process. I, I, I didn't connect with it. I didn't, it didn't for the most part mean that much to me, even though I enjoyed the social world at school. So, so yeah, so I sort of look back and have a sense of wanting that to be different for, um, uh, for sort of tomorrow's generation, for today's young people, if you like. Um, I remember going traveling for a, probably, oh gosh, I don't know, when I was about 19, probably left my traveling for about four years, having discovered the, the, the wonders of yoga and mindfulness. I was like, right, I'm going to India. I'm going to go and find out what this is all about. And um, and that was really personally transformative for me. It, 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 um, it uh, gave me a sense of, yeah, a sense, a sense of the things that I was just saying were lacking, a sense of direction, a sense of purpose, a sense of richness, a sense of, yeah, this is what I want to be about. This is what I want to chase. This is what I want to find out about. A real valued life direction, if you like. Brilliant. But I reached a point with that where, where sort of, my, you know, the mindfulness and the yoga is wonderful. And I've, I've kept up mindfulness practice ever since like 24, 25 years now. Um, uh, but there was a, something that was a little bit missing from it. And then when I came back to um, the UK and started my formal studies, just after my undergrad, actually, when I dipped into postgraduate study, I discovered ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, which is also mindfulness based, but very much mm -hmm. pragmatic and about how you use mindfulness to engage with the world and engage in the world in ways that build meaning and purpose and kind of vitality and I, I, I was that was back in 2006 and I was absolutely hooked from that from then on and I've been a complete um uh, uh, fanatic or fanatic <laughs> <laughs> since then I love the model it's um transformed my life and um when I apply it I notice how profoundly um positive it is in the life of others so um mm. that's how I came to this practice really so because <clears throat> I mean I think and most people have heard of mindfulness now, but ACT might be something that's quite new for people. Um, obviously, we've got your your book, um, ACT for Dummies, which could be a really good place to start. Is there anywhere else that you would direct people to if they wanted to learn, especially um, if we think about parents or school practitioners, where would be a good place for them to find out a little bit more about it? 
Mm, okay, yeah. So some good general introductions would be things like The Happiness Trap by Russ Harris. That's, uh, that's probably the best-selling act book out there in the literature. Actually, that's a really good one. A good introductory um, practitioner manual is probably another Russ Harris book called Act Made Simple. Um, if you want to really focus in on the on work with kind of staff and school staff, which we do ever such a lot of, um, The Mindful and Effective Employee by Paul Flaxman and uh, uh, Frank Bond and Frederick Livheim is a really great place to start. And if, um, as I'm guessing will be the case for so many of the uh, listeners or viewers of this little piece, um, I'd probably dip into some of Louise Hayes and Joe Cherokee's work first and foremostly. So books like Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life for Teens, um, uh, The Thriving Adolescent, and very recently, just last year, um, their third book, Your Life, Your Way. Those are all great texts to start with. Um, good parenting work uh, workbook is The Joy of Parenting by Lisa Coyne and Amy Morell. Um, they do great work in that field. Um, and uh, and we, 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 have, we have quite a few papers published on it, it, in the area of kind of ACT in schools, DNAV in schools, contextual variable science more generally in, in kind of school and educational context that I could give you for references if that's useful. Oh, that'd be really useful. Thank you. Um, and that, okay. the book, The Thriving Adolescent, that you talked about, that um, talks about that <laughs> DNAV model, doesn't it? That's right, yeah. Okay, yeah. fab. And so hey, that's the uh, core text. Yeah. And that, and hopefully you'll tell us a little bit more about that later when we talk about Connect, if that's okay, because I think it'd be really sure. interesting for people to hear about. Um, so um, our second question, I think this is one that people really want to hear your opinion on, um, which is, have you, do you have any advice at the minute? Obviously, everyone's going through quite a difficult time um, and really wanting to know how they can support the, the well-being and mental mm. health of young people. What would your advice be to mm. staff or parents? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, you know, and, and I want to say thanks, Sally, for sending your, your proposed questions through to me before the, yeah, before this conversation, so I had a chance to reflect on them. Um, uh, and as I track back how I reflected on the questions, and I immediately, and the question sort of invited me to, I suppose, I immediately jumped into, right, what can we do to help children? And when I, start, I started to make a list of some things that feel like maybe use, might be useful to say, I then suddenly thought, actually, no, no, I've dived in too quickly. Actually, let's just circle back. Because I think the first and probably most important thing for teachers, adults more generally, because parents have suddenly become educators, right, um, is, is self-care for adults, self-care for teachers and self-care for um, parents. And so one of the things I would try to create a space for and encourage um, uh, both teachers and parents slash now educators alike is take time to reflect on what self-care means for you and take time to reflect on how you would want to bring that to life. You know, uh, it looks different for everybody. Um, it usually tends to involve some kind of exercise and staying physically active. It usually tends to involve some kind of connecting with people who you care about in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. It usually tends to involve some kind of giving and cooperative kind of process whereby yeah, people are sort of trying to give back in a way that feels meaningful for them. But it also usually involves downtime, you know, good, good diet and good sleep patterns as much as we can in a, in a, in a, in a world where so many of us are ruminating a lot, I imagine. Um, so, so, yeah, taking time to reflect on and really bring into your actions, into your behaviour, um, self-care, um, self-care moves, as I often call them. Um, uh, I love that metaphor, put your own oxygen mask on first before you try and help anybody else. And uh, I really think that's relevant here. Okay. Yeah, and I kind of, by extension, my, my experience from talk, being a parent of two and um, having so many friends who are parents and talking to so many professionals who are parents and trying to find their way through this difficult time in human history is that we all have days where we just feel like we're kind of, not succeeding at anything. Um, one of my favorite psychologists, Kelly, calls them sit on your hands days. You know, <laughs> you know, you're not you're not gonna make any progress, but try not to make things too much worse. You know, that it's um that we all have difficult days. We all have days right now where we feel like we're failing a little bit. And that sense of um that is I, I'd like to think, and I say this from personal experience as well as as a kind of professional, um kind of the norm you know it, it we, we live in such difficult times right now and um there will be days and there are days 
when we feel like we're not getting things right. Mm -hmm. And so just to recognize that and normalize that and go, hey, we're all struggling. Tomorrow's another day. Gently, you know, a lifetime of many gentle returns to, to what, what we care about and to what matters to us. It's another Kelly, Kelly Wilson phrase. Um, yeah. So that's the, that would be my kind of first lead in with that question. Um, and I don't know what you think, but when it comes to once all of that's kind of locked in and we're doing our best under such challenging times to apply self-compassion and self-care, possibly the most important thing, I think, is to support children in doing some of the things that are outlined in the um, New Economics Foundation's Five Ways to Wellbeing, which is more recently, and this relates to our curriculum, being interpreted as a kind of, or, or kind of reconceptualized as a six ways to wellbeing. So getting children doing plenty of exercise, you know, not, including not too much screen time, um, doing what we can given what the situation affords to help children connect with the social world around them, doing things with them to help them find ways to give back to um, their community and to others, perhaps some who are not in some ways as fortunate as, as, as they are perhaps. Um, doing things that challenge ourselves to learn in meaningful ways, um, to learn and grow and develop. And, and taking time just to be together and play. Um, uh, and, and notice the world around you and, and, and time to appreciate and have a bit of gratitude. Yeah. I think if you can bring those things into the life of children in abundance, and I really want to make the distinction between talking about them and doing them. It's the doing them that really matters. And talking's behavior as well. Talking's also doing. But, um, you know, perhaps the most obvious example, talking about exercise doesn't make you fit and, fit and healthy and strong. <laughs> doing exercise makes you fit and healthy and strong. Um, talking about going to see your friends doesn't give you a sense of not being connected um, or being connected and not being alone. It's the doing of it that makes the difference. Absolutely. I think it all links in with the um, where you where you started out talking about the self care as well. It's it's so important, isn't it, for parents to model that behaviour and model that all of those things that actually we're we're trying to support children with doing. It's so important for parents to make time for themselves to do it as well. I think a lot of parents feel that it's it's not important or it's in some way selfish or, or they're always putting other people and their children above themselves but it's so yeah. important to do those things to show how important they are yeah i, I, I couldn't agree more you know mo modeling social modeling is such an important way of how we humans learn especially how children learn from adults about how to be in the world so mm -hmm. yeah it really matters and and i think other examples of that are things like making space for the whole of children's experiences and modeling that it's okay to be in the presence of emotional difficulties. Like, um, of course, of course we are. In actual fact, that's just normal for human beings. We all experience worries, anxieties, self doubts, and all of that kind of stuff that some of the mental health literature that I don't really subscribe to would say, that's the stuff we're trying to reduce. No, no, that's just part of the human condition. Let's make space for that and let's talk about that. So, you know, um, uh, making space for the fact that a child might be feeling anxious or worried about something, helping them to name that, helping, which is emotional literacy, right? Mm -hmm. Helping them to normalize that. Yeah, I, well, I completely, un and, and making that okay, making space to accept that. Yeah, I can totally understand why you'd be feeling that way. Goodness me. And then helping them also to engage in a process of sort of thinking about what might help in that situation. Oh, what can we do now that you're feeling a little bit worried? What might help to make things better? um yeah facilitative isn't it i suppose rather than directive yeah absolutely it's just making me think about all the links between all these different things because i feel like there will be a lot of um educators perhaps watching this thinking i know about mindfulness i don't know about too much about act but they may know about emotion coaching and that sort of fits quite well with what you were just saying there about the labeling the emotions and the empathizing and the um the showing that it's okay and the normalizing the validating is all of that part of act as well absolutely yeah yeah i think there's a lot to like about um emotion coaching i'm a fan too and um yeah many aspects of what you might do in act with a young person you would also see in good solid you know adept emotion coaching practice as well 
Okay, fab. Um, so on to the next question. I just want to talk very quickly about um, Belief Foundation, because some people watching won't know exactly what we do. We're a very, very new um, charitable organisation, and our main aim is to, um, to develop preventative and early intervention support for mental health and well-being within schools so that hopefully fewer children go on to need that real targeted um, support and so we've we've raised some funds and when we started to look at ways to um, use those funds to best effect we came across connect and it was just it was like um it was everything we were looking for and more basically in one very beautifully um produced program and um, some of our schools are now using that we've funded it in uh, three different schools so far and we're hoping to roll it out to more and the feedback has just been incredible so far they're really the teachers are loving it <laughs> the children are loving it which is perfect because um because that can be quite difficult with PSHE especially where teachers are, are sort of trying a bit of a mix and match of different resources from different places and it all just feels a little bit scrambled together and the connect program is really well produced and it's got a really clear sort of progression throughout the whole thing with really good resources so um I just wondered really with I'll stop rambling on about it and it, <laughs> hand over to you you could tell us a bit more about it mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I need to now. I think you've kind of just said all the things I would want to say, or a lot of them anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to hang over your language about proactive and preventative, because that very much articulates how we would want to think about Connect. Um, when we started thinking about and then began the kind of three or four year journey of actually developing the uh, Connect PSHE programme, um, the, the dream was the application of the best evidence-based kind of science-based practice of human psychological well-being in the form of a proactive, preventative, universal, not, not as in not targeted, not wave two, not wave three in schools terms, wave one school-based whole school provision uh, package for all children. So a, a well-being curriculum that all children act, uh, access, like, you know, why wait to give children well-being and resilience skills until, until things have gone wrong? Like, let's give it all to them. Because guess what? We're all going to struggle because that's just part of living. And it's definitely part of living a life with meaning. Because when you move toward meaningful things and things that matter to you, it means you've got to be, there will be challenges along the way. So we want to give these kinds of um, well-being skills that are so well understood, I think, within the research literature today, or you know, it's, all, it's an ongoing journey, but pretty well understood within the research literature today to, to all children early, proactively and preventatively. But we also knew that in uh, here in England, there were um, pretty significant statutory processes going on that we wanted to tie into in order that um, we could help school, schools to do as many useful things and legally required, statutorily required things as possible. So what we decided to do was to make sure that our uh, curriculum was not just informed by the best kind of science that we know of human psychological well-being and evidence informed practice, but also to link it to the government's changes around PSHE curriculums, which um, was supposed to be already in effect, but um, due to the pandemic is now delayed until last I heard April 2021. So all of our uh, 250 plus lesson, I think it's 252 in total, plus the introductory terms, lesson plans link to one or other of the UK's uh, statutory requirements for PSHE curriculums for the primary phase of education. Um, uh, so we cover all of that stuff and kind of more really. Um, <clears throat> um, and the other thing that was really significant is that uh, in, gosh, I, I want to say recently, but it's actually quite a long time ago now. So December 2017, the government published their children's mental health green paper. And we wanted very much for this to be partly in the light of that, um, uh, but partly because ideologically, this is what we feel is useful and workable, mm -hmm. <clears throat> an evidence-based well-being program as well, mental health program, I prefer the term well-being program. So, so we call kind of Connect PSAHE a a primary children's mental health and well-being PSHE curriculum when we're not worrying too much about tripping over our tongues, if you like. Um, uh, yeah, so, so those were the kind of premises. Um, and so what we decided to do 
after lots and lots of kind of strategizing and think what does this need to look like is have six termly themes based on the six ways to well-being or kind of six you might call them almost like kind of categories of action um, uh, that are so well understood as being highly supportive of and highly predictive of human well-being and they include um, uh, I'll, I'll call them what we call them in slightly different terms to the um, New Economics Foundation's analysis or the six ways to well-being analysis that um, uh, Gitanjali um, Batikov uh, recently developed that built on the New Economics Foundation's analysis. So we call them uh, uh, exercise, self-care, give to others, connect with others, challenge yourself and uh, embrace the moment, which is kind of like the take time to notice and be and embrace the moment fully. Um, so every term theme, uh, or every term rather, is focused on one or other of those six ways to well-being, right the way up through the ages from year reception through to year six. Um, so that, that's, a, if you kind of think about it as the curriculum structure, you might say those are kind of like, let's say those are kind of the walls, if you like, of the, of the structure. And then the, if it's a kind of multi-story building or a skyscraper or whatever you want to call it, the kind of, but this is going to, this is actually not a skyscraper because it's got six floors. So it's uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying to work with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are, there are kind of six, six floors, if you like, if we're kind of sticking with that kind of building structure metaphor. And those are effectively the six skills detailed within the, DNAV model, which was again developed by Louise Hayes and Joe Cherokee, which is the ACT, the Acceptance and Commitment Therapy for Youth model. And it's important to note, I suppose, that both ACT and kind of therefore DNAV are what we call, it's a bit of a techie term, like transdiagnostic models. What that means is that it's not, well, in our terms, what that means is that ACT and DNAV are not just models for, um, they're not deficit models, should we say. They're not models just for people who happen to meet the criteria for particular mental health diagnoses or, or something like that. They have a, a, like a general account of the human condition underneath them, driving them, of the human language and cogn cognitive condition actually driving them. And therefore the skills that they, the wellbeing skills that they work on developing are relevant to all of us, which is why this works for a, for a, for a universal curriculum rather than just for targeted work. Brilliant. I just love that, um, that that language starts right from the very start, right from reception, and that they're building on that and using the same language all the way through. So that by the time they've got to year six and they're about to go to secondary school and they're facing that big transition, which can always be a bit of a trigger point, they've got so many tools and so many yeah. ways of talking about their well-being and ways of supporting their well-being and, and accepting yeah. the fact actually it is going to be a potentially quite anxious time but knowing that that's okay and they've got ways of dealing with that I just think it's so powerful and it also gets over that issue of um, you might have someone who teaches you in year three who uses certain language around mental health and well-being and then someone else in year five who talks about it completely differently and leaves you a bit confused and just with bits and bobs everywhere and not really having any really concrete way of, um, of understanding it. Oh, absolutely. And when, when you look at some of the qualitative and, mi and mixed maths literature um, within the kind of ACT world, including with young people, but um, uh, uh, for, for me personally, I'm thinking about some of the staff wellbeing literature, that stuff really comes out of the qualitative interviews as well. Mm -hmm. You know, like often at baseline, the, the group that you're working with, some of them uh, show up on measures as clinically stressed and clinically struggling in some particular way, and others don't. But actually, when you look at some of the qualitative uh, data alongside the data from the people who were not particularly clinically struggling at baseline, they talk about it in that way. You know, even though I was feeling OK at the beginning of the course, at the beginning of the program, I feel like this has really given me some tools to help me when I am struggling in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, a really nice articulation of this proactive, preventative piece that we're trying to build in. Give people the tools early. Um, not just because they really happen to need them at a particular point in time. That's our, that's our, our hope anyway. Absolutely. Well, um, if we just move on to our very final question, which I think does sort of link in anyway um, to this quite nicely. Um, it's a question we ask everybody and it's just, 
what would what do you wish that you'd known about mental health or, or well-being more generally when you were at school mm. oh it's a lovely question it's probably the one i had to think the hardest about <laughs> when you sent it through to me actually it's a really it's a it's a lovely question and it's a really interesting one it's really made me think that the first thing i suppose that showed up for me when i reflected on that question is that i'd love to have had a more i don't know scientifically grounded and probably evolutionary understanding of how and why the human mind is the way it is mm -hmm. you know I, 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 as an educational psychologist probably like yourself I, I, I go into schools all of the time where there are um, messages up around the place that are all about like think good feel good um, and whilst in some ways I have quite a lot of sympathy for that it doesn't quite chime with what we understand of the human condition Mm. As in, if you look at the literature on uh, 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 research literature around the mind having a negative bias, it seems quite clear. The human mind has a negative bias. Now, that's not a pessimistic thing. It's not like, oh, gosh, gosh we're all doomed. We're, we all think so negatively. That's not it. Like, evolutionarily speaking, the human mind to be this, and it is, isn't it, like an incredibly sophisticated and effective kind of problem-solving um, biological apparatus, if you want to call it that. And so, so that the mind evolved to have this kind of negative bias. So like from, from our point of view, evolutionary speaking, like the presence of tricky thoughts and tricky feelings is not the problem. The question is, how do we relate to those tricky thoughts and tricky feelings? Like, can we relate to them in a way that's skillful? Like when they're not helpful for us to hold them at a bit of a distance and so I'm just, just just call it out. It's just a thought. It's just a feeling. It's a transient thing. It rises. It stays a while and it passes. Um, but also sometimes tricky thoughts and feelings, they're there because they're really important messengers. They tell us things about what matters to us. Like I often use the phrase, people don't get anxious about things they don't care about. So if you're feeling a bit of anxiety, ask yourself, what is it inside that anxiety that matters to you? Oh, I have loved to have known that as a, as a school child, you know, as a teenager, particularly as a teenager. So I'd love to have known a bit more about that and about why the mind is as it is. Um, kind of psychology, I suppose, evolutionary psychology, but applied to the human mind. Yeah. Um, I'd love to have had the opportunity to do, to do more mindfulness. Like I was very lucky to discover it at a relatively young age, at kind of 19, 20. Um, but oh, I'd love to have discovered it. There's so, there's so many, there's so many primary schools doing mindfulness now, right? Yeah. Um, including connect schools because mindfulness is in every single lesson plan. Um, it's an, we do an opening mindfulness exercise in every one of the lesson plans, but I'd love, you know, I almost feel a bit jealous of the children. I, said, oh, I wish I had that when I was at school. Um, and more opportunity to reflect on my values and what I cared about. That, that would be a really big thing. Um, a, a, ch a chance for school to have helped me discover what I wanted to be about a little bit more because I didn't have that experience at school. So our hope is that, um, yeah, I wish I had had more than that. And our hope is that Connect will help schools and children to have a bit more of that. Yeah, absolutely. I love that, um, what you were saying there about um, just noticing, noticing those thoughts. And because I think as soon as you just take time to notice them and the mindfulness practice that they're doing will really help them with that, won't it? Um, but just noticing the thoughts and noticing why they're there, it suddenly takes the some of the fear away from those thoughts and also the emphasis on having to challenge those thoughts and not being negative and having to change those thoughts because because it's that easy <laughs> um but just being able to notice notice them and and accept them i guess is really powerful isn't it mm. oh so, so powerful so important okay fab. well thank you so much duncan thank you for talking yeah, to us today right. If um, people want to learn a bit more about Connect, um, where can they go to to learn a bit more? Yep, so um, the obvious place is to go to our uh, website, which is um, uh, connect-pshe.org. Um, and actually, it's a really good time to be having this conversation because what I can mention is that um, we've just changed our free trial just the day before yesterday, actually. Um, uh, such that any school now can access the full curriculum for one week by signing up to the trial. 
Um, what we were noticing before is that um, the free trial gave a sample of lesson plans, but really didn't give schools, educators, anybody a really full opportunity to, to, to check out Connect in all of its depth. Um, so you can access the whole thing for free now for a week to get a full sense of what it's like. And also um, by doing that, it also means you can access the full training package and the um, uh, section four of the five sections of the, um, the, uh, the online training, which is delivered by myself and my colleague, Nick Hooper, um, is a one and a half hour standalone introduction to ACT and DNAV. So even just to go in and check that out and get a bit of a sense of what ACT and DNAV is in a bit more depth might be useful. Okay. Again, connect-pshe.org. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Duncan, and thank you to everyone for listening at home. Thank you so much. Great to speak to you. Mm -hmm.